This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, stepping up, volunteer-led groups receive a helping hand to get food to those struggling with high grocery prices. Access to aquaculture, the province speeds up approvals for oyster and mussel farms in southern Nova Scotia. And uncertain future, questions about what's next for a popular Glace Bay restaurant. A little unsettled again on Tuesday with some isolated shower chances, but we'll see some sunshine in the mix and temperatures staying mild. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. With grocery prices skyrocketing over the past few years, more and more people are looking for help to stock their pantries. Across Nova Scotia, small volunteer-run groups are stepping up, and some of them just got a boost in funding to help meet the demand. Taryn Grant has that story for us tonight. It's tucked away behind a church in downtown Dartmouth, but plenty of people still find this community fridge and pantry. Oh, the need has increased um, significantly over the last couple of years. Volunteers stock it twice a day with about $100 worth of groceries, but that runs out quickly. A provincial grant worth $50,000 will help the group buy more. We're going to stretch that for the year, so we're going to add to our daily shops um, by $100, $150 every day. The province is giving more than 100 grants, totaling $10 million, to community groups to tackle food poverty. It's a growing problem in every corner of the province, and it's no mystery why. Statistics Canada says grocery prices have gone up more than 20% in the past three years. In Yarmouth, a group of volunteers responded by starting a meal delivery program just over a year ago. They've since registered as a charity called Acts of Kindness, and they're now making 800 meals a week. It's a huge demand, more, more, than, we can, more than we can handle. The province is giving Acts of Kindness $200,000 to keep its meal program going and to stock a community fridge and pantry, like the one in Dartmouth. Nodigar says the grant money is a great help, but in the long term, she has higher hopes than just more handouts. I would hope that the need doesn't continue indefinitely. I would sort of look... I would ask people to um, advocate to government and policymakers for systemic change and policies that help to lift people out of poverty and that they can purchase their own food and have enough money to um, do that. But it's not likely that the doors to this pantry will close for good anytime soon. Taryn Grant, CBC News, Dartmouth. Staying with your pocketbook, Canadians who filed their taxes before March the 15th should see their first quarterly carbon tax rebate today. The checks or direct deposits are meant to help offset the cost of higher fuel. Ottawa's increase of $15 per tonne of car on carbon went into effect on April the 1st. That means paying an extra 3.3 cents per litre at the pumps. In Nova Scotia, quarterly rebates are $103 for uh, uh, a single person and $206 for a family of four. If you haven't filed your taxes yet, your rebate is still coming. CRA says it will arrive six to eight weeks after your return is assessed. The Federal Finance Minister, Christia Freeland, will present the 2024 budget tomorrow. We already know the Liberal government intends to spend $40 billion on new initiative, but it remains to be seen how it will be able to do that while keeping its promise to remain fiscally prudent. Ashley Burke has more. A new pair of shoes for a budget that might feel like a retread. The finance minister's purchase from millennial and Gen Z entrepreneurs, the generation her party is trying to win over with its budget. We already have a good idea of what initiatives are in the budget, but we don't know how the government intends to pay for them. Our country cannot succeed unless young people succeed. The prime minister didn't offer any hints about new sources of revenue, instead focusing on his message to young Canadians. Our country cannot succeed unless young people can imagine themselves succeeding. And they just don't feel that right now. So far, the Liberals have revealed $38 billion in commitments over a number of years. That will cover initiatives for housing, artificial intelligence, and a national school food program. So far, about $17 billion in promises involve loan-based programs. About $21 billion could hit Canada's bottom line directly. Will we see the deficit grow? No. 
That means new revenue needs to come in. Let's be honest, they have to raise taxes. I mean, how else are we going to do this? I don't think that it should be a big secret, but can we do it in a thoughtful, provocative way? The NDP wants the government to make companies pay. Let's take on the corporate greed, which is driving up the cost of living. But experts warn if that happens, the cost could get passed on to consumers. When you're uh, looking to raise revenues, often you need to, to apply a, a, a tax that's going to affect a broad uh, portion of your uh, income earners otherwise, and that includes, uh, you know, middle income, uh, middle income uh, earners. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to get around this, to tell you honestly. The finance minister has repeatedly said the government will not raise taxes on the middle class. Tomorrow, we're expecting to find out if the wealthiest corporations and taxpayers may have to pay more. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. I'll talk to political scientist Lori Turnbull about what Nova Scotia can expect in the federal budget. That's our Newsmaker interview just after 6.30. The search for a missing 73-year-old woman in Pictou County has been suspended. The Glasgow police say Adair Townsend was last seen early Tuesday morning in the Mount William area. Townsend is said to have a mild case of Alzheimer's and is known to take walks on her own. Since last Monday, an extensive search was conducted by volunteers from multiple organizations across the province, covering dense wooded areas, streams, trails, streets and waterways. Police say search efforts were suspended Saturday evening but may be renewed if they receive any new information from the public. Nova Scotia Power says it needs $31 million for an electrical upgrade at the Michelin Tire Plant in Waterville. The cost would be shared by all customers, including residential ratepayers. Two years ago, the Houston government imposed rules requiring NSP to nearly instantaneously restore power during brief disruptions at large industrial facilities. It's meant to avoid costly production shutdowns in the event of an outage. Under these rules, an issue at the Michelin plant in Nova Scotia is considered a network issue. NSP needs to fix the problem within 18 months or face $25,000 a month in fines. The utility submitted an application to the Utility and Review Board on Friday. Nova Scotia has moved to speed up approvals for shellfish aquaculture in the southern part of the province. It has pre-approved dozens of potential sites for oyster and mussel farms in conjunction with the municipality of Argyle. Paul Withers explains. Today's designation puts an open for business sign for shellfish aquaculture here in Argyle. Provincial Fisheries Minister Kent Smith was in Tuscan today for the announcement. Today marks the official launch of the first ever marine plant and shellfish aquaculture development area right here in the district of the municipality of Argyle. The municipality did the legwork, gathering science data, securing federal approvals and holding public meetings, pre-screening to identify suitable sites. Lease applications will be subject to a provincial administrative review. It's going to save them two to three years because uh, if they just apply for these things, all this work that we've done in the last few years has to be done by the government, right? They have to do all the testing, they have to do all the, uh, make sure that, that they'll grow there. So we did all this preliminary work for them. Local oyster farmer Nolan Dion will apply for one of the sites. He says he could triple production here in Argyle. It's a really big deal for Dion oysters because we can't produce enough oysters on our leases to, to, to for the demand. Ken Smith hopes aquaculture development areas can be exported. But it's going to depend on the municipality that uh, we really relied on the, the folks here at Argyle a lot to do the groundwork and get community engagement and community buy-ins. Opportunity for oyster and mussel farmers in Argyle elsewhere. The sector has been stymied by the lengthier public hearing process. That hasn't changed. Well, there's somewhere close to two dozen uh, aquaculture uh, applications in, in the line for, for leases and, and properties across the province. The municipality here has been promoting an aquaculture development area for many years. Today, they got it over the finish line. Paul Withers, CBC News, Argyle. The municipality of East Hants is looking to better prepare for the next emergency. It's hiring a manager of protective services to head up the emergency management office. There will also be a liaison between fire, RCMP and search and rescue. Until now, these key safety roles have been spread across multiple people. 
The CAO for the East Hance says lessons were learned after major flooding hit the area hard last summer. There were things that we could have done probably proactively to, I don't know that anyone can actually prepare for that level of rain, um, but just having a more coordinated approach to some of these weather events. Um, you know, we've had a couple of hurricanes over the last few years, uh, and, and that all takes energy and effort, and someone needs to be paying attention. Ramsey says this move is especially important as the province rolls out its new Department of Emergency Management. She expects the new manager will start in the next few months. Ryan Snodden with us now. Well, things started out damp this morning, but boy, it turned into a wonderful day in Nova Scotia. Yeah, certainly across the mainland, we've been watching things clear from west to east. And uh, yeah, it's been an interesting day. Cape Breton, not a bad start, but the rain has been kind of marching in there as the system has been moving uh, west to east. And note where temperatures are really warm uh, for highs today, where we cleared first in the west. 18 at Shelburne, 17 Kedgy, uh, 16 at Greenwood. Not bad, 15, 16 in the metro area. Again, a little cooler in Cape Breton, but uh, 14 there at Shetta Camp as the rain is just starting to clear away from Cape Breton over the last hour or so. So, And the clouds quickly clearing in behind as well. This is the low, though, that we're going to be watching for the next couple of days. It is a slow mover. Why? Well, we've got a big blocking high I hate those words, I know, setting up east of the region, and that high is going to slow the momentum of this system down. Now, the good news for us is that it will work to the east, and so we will be seeing in its wake uh, not a bad day tomorrow, mix of sun and cloud and some isolated shower chances, uh, but they will be just that, isolated, and temperatures will be quite lovely. Most of us will be between 12 and 16 degrees again, a little cooler in onshore sea breezes. Now for Wednesday, that low starting to spin east of Newfoundland, and as a result, we're going to get into a northerly flow. What that will mean is temperatures on Wednesday are going to be a little bit cooler, high single, some low double digits, but uh, noticeably cooler Wednesday. And again, a few isolated shower chances. That low sitting and spinning on Thursday. And again, a bit of a northerly flow again on Thursday. So temps taking a bit of a hit, but we'll at least see some sunshine. And if you're thinking about grumbling about the low temperatures, well, that is, uh, yes, accumulating and possibly significant snowfall over Newfoundland on Thursday. So it's all relative this time of year, Tom. <laughs> could always be worse. Yes, it? for sure. Okay, thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you. Police in Halifax arrested 21 people early this morning following a demonstration outside the Provincial Justice Department. The protesters were coming together to show solidarity with the people of Gaza. They were joining demonstrators in more than 55 cities across the world in an attempt to disrupt major logistical hubs. Police say the demonstrators were interrupting traffic flow and refused to leave the roadway. They're facing one count each of obstruction, and some will face additional charges under the Motor Vehicle Act for failing to obey to the direction of a peace officer. Police say they're being released today. We have an update tonight on the health care improvement contest the Houston government launched six months ago. The province launched a $50,000 contest to gather ideas from health care workers. Ten ideas emerged as winners, but CBC is taking a look at some of the ideas that did not make the final cut. Shana Luck has that story. Remember that contest for healthcare workers? Submit a quick and easy idea for a chance to win a cash prize. More than 2,000 people entered. The province announced a few of those ideas, but we wanted to know what else did healthcare workers have to say. So I got my hands on the full list. Here's a few suggestions. free tuition for doctors, pay for nursing licenses, public exercise programs, bring in the military, use homing pigeons to carry medication between hospital sites. Really, someone submitted that? Some of the entries ask to add comforts in healthcare facilities, like free parking, more plants, clean drinking water stations, warm blankets, privacy screens, or healthy food and coffee. Some staff were glad to give their opinions. One person wrote, it was the first time in a long time I've felt that I have any ability to contribute toward improving things. But not everyone was happy. There is no quick fix here, one person wrote. Fund health care. It's what this government campaigned on. Keep your promises. I talked to a nurse who's worked in Nova Scotia for 34 years. She and her colleagues didn't take the contest very seriously. And our thought was, oh my God, 
they're offering a thousand dollar contest for people's opinions on remedies for health care and we're like the government doesn't know what they're doing many submissions were about pay shift scheduling high turnover or burnout work-life balance was a priority some staff wrote about a feeling of being disrespected or undervalued full-time in Nova Scotia is really hard because depending on what your schedule is you're doing days your nights your weekends your holidays to me the respect for the profession is declined and a lot of older nurses are feeling it. I also asked Doctors Nova Scotia if they had any thoughts on the contest. They feel staffing shortages are the real problem in the system, but they said creative solutions could relieve some pressure. Meanwhile, the province says work is happening on the 10 winning ideas in the contest. So we're getting there. The winners included things like a text notification system to remind patients about appointments, or installing screens in all ERs to show wait times. We, we talked about, you know, um, inexpensive ideas as an example and things that are simplistic, but often there's more behind the scenes that has to happen, so there are a number of them that are underway now. One of the winning ideas has already been implemented. Six are being worked on and three are being assessed. Shana Luck, CBC News, Halifax. The future of the popular Miner's Village restaurant in Glace Bay remains up in the air tonight after previous operators did not renew their lease. The search is on to find someone to run the business. And with the busy tourism season around the corner, the clock is ticking. The CBC's Kyle Moore has that story. The Miner's Village restaurant is empty today, its future up in the air. The previous operators decided not to renew their lease, meaning they wouldn't be opening the doors for the summer. Right now, we don't have a leaseholder, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody to take over the lease of the restaurant so it can be open this season. The restaurant is more than a place to eat. Its decor dates back to an early age and helps tell the story of mining in Cape Breton. It's an attraction for both tourists and locals alike. It also helps bring visitors to the neighboring Cape Breton Miners Museum. We get a lot of tours through the uh, museum and most of them want to do the museum, they want to come have a meal and then they want to go on their way. 11,000 visitors came through the Cape Breton Miners Museum last year. It's an attraction that has economic impact on the area and the restaurant is part of that. Anytime you lose a business, it's devastating, but uh, one such as the Miners Village Restaurant, you know, it's, it's, it's a restaurant, great food and it brings people there. It brings people, people come to Glace Bay just for that sometimes. David McKeegan is the president of Bay It Forward. The group's focus is to build partnerships to promote and initiate growth in the community. He says attracting new businesses downtown has been a challenge over the years. It's a loss of jobs. It's a, it's a loss of a, of a business. It's income coming into the town that we need. Back at the restaurant, the search is on for a new operator. There has been a lot of interest, a lot of phone calls. Uh, we've done a lot of interviews. I've had phone calls from Alberta, from Ontario. A couple of local people have been interested, but so far nobody's actually bit. Mumbercat was hoping the restaurant could be back open for Mother's Day next month, but for now, its future remains in limbo and the light's off. Kyle Moore is CBC News, Glace Bay. An Acadian group on the eastern shore is transforming a former church into an event space and community centre. The Acadian Heritage Committee bought the former St. Anselm Roth Roman Catholic Church last year for one dollar. The church closed in 2018 because of mould and was deconsecrated in 2022. The committee chair says she hopes the space will be reopened by next summer. I don't want to divulge too much information, but it's going to be a new centre for the community uh, where there'll be a stage for entertainment and um, like a dance floor. Um, and part of the church will be kept as it is, representing the old, and then part of it will be the new. The group got a $1.5 million grant from Ottawa for renovations. The Heritage Committee is hosting a public meeting at the Cheswick Cook Fire Hall on the evening of May the 2nd to share its plans with the community. A Nova Scotia woman who inspired many people across the province has died. Lunenburg resident Joy Saunders made headlines in 2020 when she did a series of fundraising walks for the VON at the age of 101 in the midst of the pandemic. Saunders spent her early years in Montreal before moving to Nova Scotia with her husband. After he died 40 years ago, she moved to Lunenburg to be near one of her daughters. A news release from the VON said she was a remarkable citizen and philanthropist. 
Joy Saunders was 105 years old. Coming up, former U.S. President Donald Trump's hush money trial starts today in New York with jury selection. Israel is vowing to retaliate after Iran's attack over the weekend, but the country's allies, including Canada, are urging restraint to defuse the situation. Quick look at the Windsor Blockhouse there. Ryan Snodden back with your full weather forecast in just a couple of minutes. All right, chilly, cool, gray, damp in some places and much of the mainland this morning. But boy, the temperature shot up this afternoon. Uh, the little bit of sun this time of mm. year makes such a big difference. And yeah, that's the difference between temperatures in the high teens and low double digits <laughs> and some low teens in the east as we saw with our highs today. Mm -hmm. But it did turn into a beautiful afternoon. Gorgeous. And yeah, it doesn't take much this time of year to uh, bring us around, right? A little blue sky makes you feel better, doesn't it? It certainly does. And a beautiful spot here. This is, of course, the South Maitland. Nice spot there along the water. 13 degrees with mostly sunny skies. And yeah, it is uh, super, super nice all across the mainland now. We've got uh, temperatures 
anywhere from well, currently low double digits, and yes, uh, we've got uh, temps a bit cooler there along that South Shore region, right in those onshore winds, obviously. Halifax, 13, 14 degrees, uh, but uh, yeah, most of us popped pretty nicely this afternoon with that sun in Cape Breton. I know skies are starting to clear there now. Uh, we'll see winds uh, currently in that 10, 20, 30 kilometer per hour range. We are looking at a couple of stronger gusts uh, up towards uh, the Amherst area, around 40 there. Overall, though, it's uh, yeah, it's not a bad evening. Now we are watching a little area here. You can see that's uh, for the most part going to be tracking offshore, but that will bring the, at least the possibility of a couple showers into the mix uh, through this evening into the overnight. No question about it. Showers off to our north as well. So we're going to kind of get squeezed here and bring in that possibility of some showers as we uh, yeah, move through the overnight hours tonight. And then on the back side of that low, we will get into some isolated shower chances yet again tomorrow before this area of high pressure swings in and brings us generally a brighter day uh, for uh, Wednesday and into Thursday. There's uh, again the, the setup across North America and this next low here brewing. You can see temperatures dropping down on the back side of that low 27 in Kansas, 30 in St. Louis. So this is a real sign as you see these types of temperatures creeping northward 23 in Chicago. 26 in New York City that we're we're getting there right slow but slowly but surely we are getting there uh, 16 in Calgary 18 in Regina uh, and again we did crack 18 degrees here uh, down in uh, Shelburne this afternoon so tonight those shower chances no doubt about it two three four five degrees so not bad to start the day for tomorrow temperature wise you can see those couple of showers in, along the Atlantic coastline overnight a couple of possibilities overnight inland and yes we'll be running that risk even into tomorrow morning tomorrow you can see we'll see a fair amount of sunshine in the mix and those chances of showers will bubble up into the afternoon uh, with some of that daytime heating that will certainly help and some of those could have some pretty heavy pockets in those showers so we'll keep an eye out for that uh, best chances are indeed uh, going to be in through the interior parts of the province but can't rule out an isolated shower really anywhere popping up tomorrow uh, for 10 to uh, 14 degrees across Cape Breton tomorrow those winds are going to be light and with those light winds, it is going to be a sea breeze type setup. So keep that in mind that if you're along the coastlines tomorrow, it's going to be cooler than it will be. Similar story for the Northumberland Eastern Shore, 12, 13, 14 degrees, but cooler right along the coast. Uh, 15, 16 degrees uh, possible in the valley tomorrow, a bit of an onshore wind in Parsboro. Amherst in the 12, 14 degree range down towards Churro. We'll see temps 12 to 14 in through the south shore. Cooler in the onshore winds near Liverpool, 16 in Bridgewater, likely closer to 12 or 13 for Lunenburg, and uh, 14 to 15 in through the Halifax area as well, but cooler again right along the Atlantic coastline. Now for Tuesday night, you can see these uh, shower chances kind of ending. Quiet start to Wednesday and that low that's setting up shop just east of Newfoundland, that's going to have an influence on us with this high coming into our west. So the winds are going to become more northerly on Wednesday and that's going to hurt our temperatures, no doubt about it. We will see some shower chances. Cape Breton and eastern parts of the mainland will be our best chances of that. Truro, Halifax and eastward is what we're saying for now. Uh, 8 to 10 degrees in through the uh, in through the west parts of the province, a little bit cooler perhaps in an onshore, onshore wind there in Yarmouth. And then again, there's that low kind of spinning off to our east, not going anywhere. And that is snow possibilities for uh, Newfoundland. For us, it's just kind of, again, a bit of a cooler flow for Thursday, maybe some double digits along the south shore, but otherwise uh, single digits is what we'll be uh, left with on Thursday. Friday, a bit milder. And it does seem like we just can't thread the needle for two sunny days on the weekend. And it looks like that's going to happen again. Uh, wet on Saturday, but recovering nicely on Sunday. At least that's the story right now, Tom. But we'll keep you posted on that throughout uh, the week. Things could change, I suppose. Okay, yeah. thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you. Well, up next, I'll talk with political scientist Lori Turnbull about what might be in tomorrow's federal budget. That's our Newsmaker interview. Stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News.
Tomorrow is federal budget day. It's Justin Trudeau's third under his government's current mandate, and it is expected to focus on the cost of living for Canadians. Lori Turnbull is a political scientist at Dalhousie University. Um, you know, we joke it used to be that budget had lots of surprises on, on, on budget day. Um, not so much anymore, certainly in recent years. What are you expecting tomorrow? Well, I, as you say, we'll hear a bunch of things that we've heard already about housing announcements and um, I, I would suspect um, the, the school food program and things like that. I think it's going to be very much focused on the housing plan as a solution to the affordability crisis. I think we'll probably hear a little bit about the federal government's approach to a greener economy. I think we'll hear um, their approach to job creation and trying to harness uh, some some of that, some of the energy around, um, you know, new housing projects, new new environmental plan, and I think their new digital strategy as well. We'll hear a lot about how that will create new jobs and stimulate the economy. So I think it'll be very much a kind of medium to long term, forward looking kind of budget. Which, of course, you know, the the question that will hang in the air is, are, are you give us going to give us enough time to do this, right? So the Liberals are kind of looking for another term to be able to get done what they want to get done. Yeah, I mean, everyone thinks about the next election in that world for sure. And the Liberals aren't doing great in the polls and the economy, you know, it's not so hot either. How much room or how much maneuverability does the Trudeau government have here when it comes to thinking in those terms on budget day? I mean, they, they can see the polls the same as we do, they, and they have internal polls too. Uh, clearly, they're not doing, they're not where they want to be at this point. The election, if it goes at the scheduled time, is going to be October of 2025. And so they've got runway between now and then to try to build a case in people's minds that they should be given another term. But at the same time, like as much as people might even like the sound of what they're talking about, when they talk about things like um, taking this this huge approach to housing and and building up new rental property and you know the infrastructure around housing and uh, help trying to deal with uh, homelessness and trying to to get you know shorter times of, for approval so that these housing projects can get up and going in earnest all of those things are are you know potentially what people really want to hear at the same time as they're hitting those notes on affordability but it's possible that people don't want to hear this from them necessarily they might you know because of voter fatigue because of this sense of frustration with this government that is palpable right and that you can see it in poll after poll it could be that they're putting they're putting up these ideas and people are not listening in the same way that the liberals are hoping it does seem that they be, you know, they're taking it on the nose with the carbon tax. It continues to give the opposition something to, to hammer the Liberals with. What, if anything, can the Liberals do in this budget to try to cope with that, or are they concerned about that? Sure. I mean, I think part of why the Prime Minister did this sort of two-week campaign-style tour across the country where he was announcing parts of the budget one after one at a time was to kind of give a bit of a counter narrative to the fact that the carbon tax went up on April 1st in affected provinces. And so he was trying to get people to talk about something other than the carbon tax and to switch, you know, change change the channel from that. I'm not sure if that was effective. There's some polls that are suggesting people are, um, the, the, the numbers for the Liberals aren't changing even as these announcements go out. And so in terms of like the political calculations, I don't know if there's anything that they can do at this point. They still have this, you know, they're going to, if they go till October of 2025, there'll be a 10 year government. And so that's what I think they're really working against. And the fact that the Conservatives and Pierre Polyev have resonated so effectively on things like the affordability crisis. Well, I wonder about that because I know there's another budget before Election Day if it comes in 2025. But how much of this budget is about trying to frame the potential election question around affordability and, you know, in terms of how much this budget sort of tries to lay out that groundwork for the Liberals in that regard? That's it, because I think there's two pieces to that, to that question. Like, first is framing it around affordability. But if we had an election now, on affordability, that would be bad for the Liberals because they're not the ones that are resonating the best on that question. That would be the Conservatives. You can see the NDP trying to position themselves as the party on, to respond to the affordability crisis. So you can see uh, last week, Jagmeet Singh started to back away a bit from the carbon tax and say, oh, you know, we're looking at other things. That's him trying to connect on the affordability issue, not so much trying to change where he is on climate policy. But I think for the Liberals, they this budget is about 
getting an opportunity to talk to people about the affordability crisis. They've come, you know, they've turned around. They've changed their minds or changed their thinking from not too long ago when the prime minister said that the federal government wasn't the one responsible for for the housing issue, that that wasn't federal jurisdiction. Clearly, there's been a lot of rethinking on that. And so here they are. But I think the other piece of that affordability question is also, are the Liberals going to be able to situate themselves as a party that people trust on this issue. Because I think, you know, at this point, Polyev and the Conservatives are the ones that are making that argument the most persuasively to the most people. And so there's still some room there for the Liberals to, to they'd have to make their case sometime between now and the next election. Yeah, you talk about affordability and you mentioned the National School Food, food Program coming. Uh, but the province has its own program that it's planning to launch. And I just wonder where the, where the federal Liberals meet there and how much of this is uh, the province not waiting for the feds to do something or try to take ground away from the feds? I mean, how do you see all that going down? I think, so for the implementation of a, of a school food program, that's not something that the federal government is going to run, run from Ottawa. That's the, the complications of that, the administration of that is just hard to think through. That is, education is a provincial jurisdiction. Um, I think that's something that would have to be administered at that more local level. And so I think probably what the feds would want to do is work with provinces who are making up their own programs and they can provide whatever funding they want. They can work with a province on whatever funding will be required. But I suspect that the ideal solution from Ottawa's perspective is that every province and territory yeah. would have a plan like that in place and they can work with them on the funding, perhaps on the criteria. Um, and that would put the provinces in, in, in a position to be able to come back to the federal government at some point for more months, more funds if that's deemed required. Right. So I think we'll probably see a bit more of that. Yeah, it's all food for thought on a pre-budget day. Laurie Turnbull, thank you so much. Thank you, too. Coming up, advocates in St. John's say unclaimed bodies and mobile freezers speaks volumes about a lack of support for seniors.
Donald Trump's hush money trial is now underway in New York. This is the first criminal trial of any U.S. president, past or present. Trump faces 34 counts of fraud but denies any legal wrongdoing and he remains defiant. This is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. Jury selection began after lawyers spent most of the morning arguing over what evidence could be introduced at trial. Trump is accused of falsifying business records involving payments allegedly made to hide accounts of extramarital affairs. There are three other criminal cases coming up against Trump, but those are unlikely to take place before the U.S. presidential election in November. Israel says it will respond to the weekend attacks by Iran. Tehran claimed the attack was a response to a strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus earlier this month. Israel hasn't confirmed or denied it was behind that attack. Now Israel's allies, including Canada, are warning against escalating the conflict further. The CBC's Chris Brown has the latest from Jerusalem. The aerial barrage Iran unleashed on Israel overnight Saturday could have caused tremendous damage. Instead, Iran telegraphed the attack in advance, giving the air defenses of Israel, the United States and other countries time to prepare and shoot down all but a few of the projectiles. Yes, yeah. In a desert Bedouin community in Israel south, a seven-year-old girl suffered a head injury from falling shrapnel. The children were frightened and wanted to run away from home. And that's when the missile hit, said her father. After a meeting of its war cabinet, Israel's military chief of staff vowed a response is coming. This launch of so many missiles, cruise missiles and drones, will be met with a response, said Herzi Halevi. Across Europe and beyond, there are calls for restraint. We are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We have been coordinating a diplomatic response to seek to prevent escalation. But unlike in Gaza, where Israel was largely in control and able to deflect international criticism of its conduct, it may have to listen more now. It required military coordination with the U.S. and even Israel's Arab neighbors, such as Jordan, to counter the Iranian strikes. We've carried out the attack on Israel in the framework of deterrence, said Iran's foreign minister, noting it was Israel that struck first by destroying its consulate in Damascus, Syria. He warned if Israel responds, Iran will not hesitate to attack again. Even if Israel does hit back, it's going to be something quite symbolic, I think, at this point. This Iran specialist says the country calibrated its attack to ensure Israeli casualties would be minimal, meaning Israel's response should be similar. In a sense, they, they gave Israel at least a ladder to not attack in a severe way, which would force them in a way to retaliate and, and to kind of escalate things to a much more violent uh, course. The confrontation with Iran has at least temporarily shifted the world's focus away from Gaza and Israel's war with Hamas and now also the West Bank, where violence between Israeli settlers and Palestinians has erupted. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem. Canada has announced sanctions against some individuals and entities allegedly involved in the ongoing conflict in Sudan. This comes as the so-called forgotten war in the Northeast African nation marks its one-year anniversary. France is hosting a humanitarian conference today to put a spotlight on the violence and suffering in Sudan. Millions in the country have been facing famine during the year-long fighting and there is no end in sight. More than 14,000 people have died and twice as many have been injured since last April. Sudan's army and its powerful paramilitary force continue to fight for control in the capital and other parts of the country. The UN estimates nearly 9 million people have been forced to flee their homes. Some seniors advocates say the complex issue of an overcrowded morgue at a St. John's hospital can be fixed if government policy aligns itself with the rising cost of living. Bodies are being stored in freezer units in an alleyway on hospital property, and advocates say the real problem isn't about storage, but about support for seniors. The CBC's Mike Moore explains. 
This storage container in St. John's is filled with bodies. That's because the main morgue is full. Some of them are seniors who didn't have the money to pay for their funerals and whose families couldn't pick up the expenses. Now, advocates want to see change. At the end of your life, when your income is about $1,600, there's not much you can do to save four or $6,000 in order to uh, die in dignity and be buried. Muhammad Abdallah's senior support organization can't legally claim bodies or arrange for funeral services, which means many of their clients can end up in one of those freezers permanently. It is a big concern, and I didn't think it was that big. Uh, that we have actually freezers outside of the hospital. I was appalled when I heard that. Families in Newfoundland and Labrador on income support can get up to $2,300 to help with cremation or burial costs. That figure hasn't changed in nearly two decades. On the federal level, the Canada Pension Plan death benefit is a one-time payment of $2,500 to the estate or family, but that figure hasn't changed since 1998. Other provinces are facing a similar situation. Ontario, for example, has seen a 170% increase in unclaimed bodies since 2019. The national advocacy group Funeral Service Association of Canada says it's time to fix that problem. The conversations that the Funeral Service Association of Canada has, has tried to have over the years um, with the federal government um, has fallen on deaf ears, really. Jeff Weaver says funeral costs can range from $2,000 all the way up to $12,000. Advocates hope Tuesday's federal budget will address some of their concerns. In a statement to CBC News, a spokesperson from the Department of Finance says they can't comment. Either way, any amendments to the CPP, which is a form of support, will have to be done in conjunction with the provinces. Mike Moore, CBC News, St. John's. There are multiple reports that Tesla is planning on laying off more than 10% of its workforce worldwide. Cuts could affect about 15,000 workers employed by the electric vehicle company. CEO Elon Musk has reportedly detailed plans in an internal memo. Tesla sales have fallen sharply in what's become a highly competitive market and price cuts have failed to attract more buyers. Sales are down nearly 9% in the first quarter of this year compared to last year. The automaker employed more than 140,000 employees globally as of December 2023. With the Paris Olympics three months away, a Canadian athlete is hoping to compete there. Paige Crozen is honing her skills as a three-on-three -three basketball player and she's getting some help. It comes from her five-year-old daughter, Erin Collins explains. As with any good team, communication is key. Do you need me to hold it for you? It may not look like it, but this is part of Olympic hopeful Paige Crozen's daily training routine. Five-year-old Poppy helping to keep her mom moving. Okay, let's go, girl. Nice. This single mom focused on getting to the Olympics in Paris. Her daughter along for the ride. Okay, so we're going to start like this. Every step of the way. Land it. Poppy pitching in to help Paige achieve her Olympic dream. So like one hand at the bottom and the other hand on the side and then frog, drop neck. Nice. So what's harder, making a three-point shot or being a single mom? Well, I've probably taken about 50,000 three-point attempts in my career and it's my first time being a single mom, so definitely being a single mom. A technicality kept Paige from getting to the last Olympics, the first for her sport of three-on-three -three basketball. Now we go, Paige. Poppy was there too, helping to provide perspective. Coming home to Poppy and she comes and runs up and gives me a big hug and then she tells me about the scrape on her knee and that's the biggest thing in her world. And now the push is on to get to Paris. Paige and her teammates prepping to play in a qualifying tournament in May, confident in their team's chances. We just need to get our reps in and get our flow, and we'll be set. We have so many great pieces, and we'll figure it out. The entire team encouraged by the development of its smallest member. 11, 12, 13, 14. We've seen Poppy grow for the last five years as she started playing 3x3, like literally from birth, you know, so... <laughs> And win or lose, the real lessons learned on this court have little to do with basketball. Find something that you love, something that you're passionate about. Find a great group of friends and a community within that. And then do that for as long as you can at whatever level you choose. I think we're at two. 
This team already winning, no matter the score. Sometimes if you make bigger bunny ears, it is a little bit easier, but whatever your preference is. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Lethbridge. Canada's main stock index lost almost 160 points today. Here's a quick look at the markets as we head to break. For news you can trust, we have the latest on what's happening in your community and a weather forecast you can rely on no matter where you are in Atlantic Canada. I'm Amy Smith. And I'm Ryan Snodden. Join us for Atlantic tonight. Right after the National. All right, back to wrap things up with weather. And, you know, April seems to be going along pretty much as expected. You know, a few gray days peeking out of the sun a little bit. Of course, we'd like to have a little more of that sun if we could. Yeah, I think in, in all the months, maybe the, the bar is set so low for April. Maybe <laughs> only March is lower yeah. in terms of expectations, right? It's a thing in Nova Scotia, that's uh, for sure. It definitely is. Um, but yes, brighter skies ahead mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Warmer days ahead as well. Have a look at our viewer picture of the day. And this one, 
We're going to zoom in on Amherst Shore, and this is just a terrific shot. You want color in a photo. Hopefully, there it is. Oh. Diane. <laughs> Lots of orange. Yeah. Yellow there for sure. That's gorgeous. Absolutely stunning picture. Thank you, Diane, for sharing. Ryan's picks at cbc.ca. That's golden hour at its finest, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, so tomorrow, a few showers kicking around, but uh, you know what? Plenty of sunshine as well. Temperatures generally ranging between 12 and 16, as you will see, uh, but the winds are light, so a bit of a sea breeze setting up uh, for sure. Uh, that'll keep temperatures cooler along parts of the coast. That is par uh, for the course this time of year. Wednesday, noticeably cooler. Temperatures pretty much single digits. We'll probably squeak into the double digits along that south shore region with that northerly flow. Shower chances for central and eastern areas on Wednesday where the clouds will be a bit more stubborn there as well. It's all thanks to that low, which is moving off to the east. There are the shower chances isolated Tuesday. Isolated chances again on Wednesday, again for the most part central and east. Note the clouds a little more uh, no prevalent, no doubt about that. Thursday, that high pressure coming in. There's that low winding up over Newfoundland, a scary sight there uh, for uh, parts of the island. Uh, but yeah, again, April snow. That's no big deal in those parts. Now uh, we will see pretty nice uh, Friday. Keeping it on that uh, Saturday system, Tom, uh, rain. Can we do better than 50-50 on the weekend? Yeah. That'd be nice, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, for sure. All right, thanks so much, Ryan. Well, there's growing interest in the rare min minerals and resources that can be found in asteroids and moons. Future exploring in low gravity will have its challenges, but Swiss researchers say uh, the solution is uh, hopping. <laughs> the idea is that um, locomotion on low gravity bodies like asteroids or moons is quite challenging, right? Especially for classic wheeled systems. The space hopper is designed to overcome low gravity by harnessing it as a method of moving around. The three-legged robot can control its flight attitude, giving it control locomotion, controlled locomotion in the tricky environment. Space hopper was successfully tested in zero gravity conditions during a parabolic flight in a reduced gravity aircraft, also known as the Vomit Comet. <laughs> Love that. One researcher compared its ability to uh, what a cat does when it jumps down using its legs to keep its body upright or get into a position for a safe landing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Watch for that. That's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night.